speakers, participants, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this timely fourth webinar, Conference on the Challenges and Prospects of Peace in the Horn of Africa, which aims at creating to have your thoughts and discuss on the contemporary issues of our region. Horn of Africa is one of the geopolitically very important hotspots of our world that draws the attention of many of the great powers with multiple political, military, and economic interests and diverse ways of engagement. So the peace and the security of the region is dependable on, the, on far beyond the internal issues of the states in the Horn. That makes the issue of peace in the Horn highly complicated and dynamic, which requires a series of well-crafted academic discussions like this one. I'm grateful to the organizers of this timely conference on, on this determined agenda, and I'm, and I'm sure be a workshop you will be most in terms of your thoughts freely and indicate directions for the decision makers and stakeholders of the peace and security of the region and beyond. And I would also like to thank the speakers that. Uh, has shown the interest to join us today and also the participants that will have a fruitful interaction. With that, I want to close my statement by thanking the College of Law and Governance for taking such initiative and organizing them as part of the Momona talk, talk series success to the country, all the fruitful discussion in in the webinar conference and the webinar conference is officially of stay safe and well. First and foremost, I would like to thank the organizers of this event for uh, uh, giving us yet another opportunity to address uh, an issue of critical importance not only to Ethiopian politics and to the future of Ethiopian state, but also equally uh, importantly uh, to the peace and stability of the whole of Africa region, which is uh, strangely enough an election that's uh, being debated whether it needs to be held or not uh, in Tigray. Uh, under normal circumstances, holding elections should not have been an issue of concern that will have far-reaching implications for security, for stability, in fact, for the continuity or otherwise of uh, a state. Because under normal circumstances, elections are part of uh, a healthy repertoire of uh, a repertoire of healthy politics, uh, let alone in Ethiopia, where uh, uh, a reform minded, at least touted as a reformer, prime minister, was ushered into in promising to undertake far reaching, sweeping reforms that would. Uh, transform the landscape of the country this have uh, uh, been considered normal in any country in Africa, uh, held as, as regularly and as periodically as possible. But it's very unfortunate that we are now dealing with a situation where a regional government that uh, is uh, uh, adamant that it should and can hold, hold its uh, elections periodically is now at the center of controversy in Ethiopian politics simply because the people who came to office uh, touted as reformers uh, have proven allergic to such an exercise as simple exercise as elections that should be periodic, free, and democratic. I am asked to speak on the legal and political implications of elections in Degray and the politics of uh, Ethiopia. Uh, although by training I would uh, still have an inclination to touch upon the legal aspects of uh, holding elections in Tigray. But at this point in time, 
uh, to indulge in uh, what I would consider an, a superfluous uh, legal analysis of uh, why and uh, what the merits of uh, holding elections are, because the issue of uh, election integra has already taken on a political significance that cannot be uh, explained away in terms of uh, fine uh, legal analysis, constitutional or otherwise. So my focus, more importantly, is going to be uh, the political implications of uh, this foregone conclusion that the Tigra has already made to hold elections within probably in days time. And the into the controversy that surrounds this this decision. It should have been the most more than he took office, started his 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 his, his uh, discharging his responsibility, as it were, by doing everything antithetical uh, to uh, APRF's tradition of collective leadership. Uh, and he was making all kinds of uh, promises to uphold the democratic principles, to undertake reforms in many parts of the country, and people. Uh, for obvious reasons, were expecting uh, postponed elections. Like I said, from the get-go, he had uh, uh, proclivities, anti-democratic proclivities, and he was more interested in doing everything in his own way. Uh, and uh, federal arrangement, uh, regional governments, regional states, uh, long-winded party meetings, uh, party hierarchy such as executive committee, central committee were minor inconveniences to be dealt with not uh, not uh, auxiliary mechanisms that would that would uh, help him run uh, run his, his his office properly so he was dismantling a prd uh, structure uh, all the way from the executive committee down to the cavalry level so everything he has been doing doing uh, ever since coming to to office uh, clearly showed the trappings of someone who was more interested in uh, authoritarian one-man leadership than the kind of collective leadership that was uh, commonplace uh, before before he came to office. Whatever uh, the difficulties of uh, collective leadership, uh, Abi could have and should have uh, uh, taken measures that to, would, would ameliorate the weaknesses of collective leadership, not to entirely dispense with it and expect magic to be done by someone who to, to all intents and purposes is, is ill-prepared for the office, uh, not necessarily academically, which, which I don't think is the most important issue in the world, but uh, even as far as political experience goes. Now, so when he had never the intention of holding elections, because for him, the only consideration uh, that needs to be taken account whether or not uh, in, in to decide whether or not to hold elections is whether his party would have an advantage over other parties to win uh, in the general election. And it was clear from the get-go by failing to make good on his promises to the very people whose, whose movement he rode to power, for example, the Keros, uh, to a certain extent, the Fanos and other youth movements in Ethiopia, it was pretty sure he had lost, he had all but lost whatever constituents he had, especially in Oromia, in many parts of Amhara, in many parts of Southern region. And it was obvious, uh, even in the best of circumstances, his party, Prosperity Party, had little or no chance to win in the general elections. Uh, so the very minor inconvenience that election represented had to be dispensed with once again. In, in every, even before the dismantling of EPR, if he was telling us several times over that, uh, Yes, we can steal elections, we can rig elections and all that. I mean, it's quite strange for, for uh, a leader who was touted as a reformer when he came to office to talk in leadership meetings about the, uh, the, the 
the merits of stealing elections. That that probably was one of the strangest experiences I had uh, in, uh, in, in many of the discussions uh, he was sharing. Now, when he decided to postpone elections, he had already, the, 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 to the extent that there was preparations uh, to hold elections, the uh, electoral board of Ethiopia was not doing anything at all. Uh, to the extent that there were some movements, they were lukewarm at best. At least they were trying to use every pretext to postpone elections. And um, Abi, fortunately for Abi, the COVID-19 uh, crisis uh, surfaces, and then lo and behold, Abi had to take that opportunity uh, to declare that it was impossible for Ethiopia to hold elections, although COVID at that point in time we didn't even do so much as pose the kind of threat it poses now. Uh, in fact, uh, prosperity parties meetings, I would say, are uh, more cause of concern as, as, as agents of transmission of uh, COVID-19 than uh, elections that can be held in a very disciplined manner, as we are trying to do here in Tigray. Now, his decision to, to, to postpone the election took a uh, another route, the constitution was clear about the need for holding elections every five years. So he came up with an idea of, uh, in fact, he imposed his will on the so called uh, Constitutional Council of, Inqu Council of Constitutional Inquiry, and they were doing their bidding, his bidding. In fact, they, 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 they didn't do so much as pretend to remain true to their professional background. Every decision was political. And the strangest thing about the interpretation process, in the first place, it was never warranted. Second, election was never on the table. Like I said, corona, the, the, the decision to use corona as a pretext was something that was, that was considered a very welcome news by Abby and company. And second, uh, even when the CCI uh, proceeded to interpret the constitution in a very strange manner, they gave him a carte blanche. They didn't give him like a very limited time within which to check if the corona uh, epidemic uh, remains a threat. So th their decision gave him a carte blanche to decide when to hold elections. That would, that, that it would, well, it would, would have to wait till kingdom come before Abi and company decided that the corona crisis is over in this country. It could be 10 years. Well, if, if, if uh, the conservative estimates of WHO are any guide, it would probably take more than 10 years. And then Abi would have uh, to rule over the country for the next 10 years before, uh, after a year, uh, he would decide to hold elections. Uh, that's one of the strangest decisions by the CCI, which was, of course, politically endorsed by the uh, Council of Federation. Third, it wasn't just a carte blanche given to uh, to to rule or to preside over the country for as long as he wanted, because he was given an indefinite period of time to lord it over uh, the entire country. Uh, the third strange element of the decision was that something which was never at issue something which was never litigated was decided upon by the CCI that regional states would regional governments would continue to exercise their legitimate power along with the federal government to begin with it is not the responsibility of the CCI to decide where the regional elections are to be held because at least if at all there was a legitimate reason to do so was where national elections were going to be held now, Abi realized that, you know, states like Tigray, which are very difficult nuts to crack, would probably use the opportunity to, to stand in the way of his, his, his uh, authoritarian ambitions. And then he had them introduce a very strange element in their decision, which was not at issue at all, by deciding that regional governments would continue to be legislate, regional councils would continue to be legislate, along with, of course, the, the federal parliament. Like I said, it's very strange because it's not their responsibility. Assuming that, let's, assuming that uh, they had even the remotest uh, responsibility to do so, it was never at issue. The regional government didn't even ask for the extension of their tenure in office. 
or the regional councils didn't ask for their extension in office. So it was obvious. They decided on the basis of something over which they don't have any power. And of, of course, it's never part of the original request by the House of People's Representatives to interpret the Constitution. So it clearly shows that. TPLF, the leadership in TPLF was, uh, okay, uh, we will hold elections uh, as per the schedule. Uh, and and uh, 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 we'll hold in, uh, what is at stake. Government and self-determination right, determination right, which is clearly enshrined in the Constitution. And more particularly for the people of Tigray, this is something they have really uh, paid for. Uh, they have uh, sacrificed, made sacrifice of thousands, and uh, it is not something they would uh, allow to be uh, to be sacrificed in the altar of Abi's expediency, political or otherwise. So when we decided as a leadership to, to go ahead with elections, uh, we knew the people of Tigray were full, would, would throw our, our, their full weight behind, behind our decision. Uh, because ultimately the people, no amount of sophistry, legal interpretation is going to uh, explain away or even back up our decisions to 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 to, to, to hold to go ahead with the elections now so for conclusion that we are holding elections but the moment the executive committee it would be this region elections periodically. The strangest thing and the most bizarre thing coming as it does, especially from a person who was touted as a reformer when he came to office, is a region that promises to hold elections, which is the most normal thing in any democracy, is being treated by the very reformer prime minister who came to office promise to hold free and fair elections unlike in the past and then it is this guy who threatens to use force against a state that vows to hold elections as per schedule to the extent that elections holding elections could be a source of controversy it should have been otherwise it should have been the, the regions threatening to withdraw legitimacy from the federal government for not upholding its responsibility to hold elections periodically. That's the strangest turn of events that, that uh, Ethiopians had to witness, especially immediately after the, the decision by the Ethiopian regional state and the ETPL leadership to go ahead with elections. It is unprecedented in the sense that any region that insists on holding democratic elections is being threatened with the use of force by someone who is in power with the promise that he would broaden political space. Well, whether or not he would make good on his promise, his threat to use force is an entirely different matter. But even from a purely semantic point of view, for a leader who has been touted by the West as a reformer to come out swinging in public Treating the use of force against a region that wants to hold elections is absolutely unprecedented in, 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 in at least recent memory, as far as, as, far as I can understand. Uh, whether or not that uh, has uh, had, a, had an impact on our decision to hold elections, everybody knows, uh, I would say is, 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 is uh, totally superfluous. So there are more political cases to be made. For one thing, we are dealing with this, the issue of self-determination, which is conditionally enshrined and which is something we have paid dearly for. 
no amount of cajoling, no amount of threatening, no amount of uh, saber rattling is going to hold us back from remain tr remaining true to the very principles that de de that inform the self determination of the right of the people of Tigray. Uh, so nothing is going to stop us, as uh, obviously. Uh, second, in a situation where Abi, the reformer, has done everything to consolidate power in the hands of one individual, he has demolished all the institutions that could have served as mechanisms of checking his, his power. No party, regional or otherwise, has any control whatsoever on whatever decisions he makes. Nobody knows which executive committee is in charge. Nobody knows who is the chairperson. Of course, there is a de facto chairperson of the party. Who knows? Who, nobody knows who is the deputy chairperson of the party. Nobody knows who is the executive member of the party. Nobody knows who is the uh, central committee member of the party. Nobody knows who is in the leadership. Nobody knows who goes out, who goes in. It is a strange situation. We have now a situation where every power within the country, except for the peace and stability of the, regi the, 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 the regions, which is out, outside the control of Abi because he's busy doing other things, not ensuring the peace and stability of the regions. Now he has technically controlled everything and the monopoly of every power in the country, security, political, social, what have you, is now concentrated in the hands of an individual simply means the next order of business is going to de declare the suspension of the constitution. And for us, holding elections and showing to the world that we are not going to compromise on our self-determination rights is a purely existential issue. Abi is allergic to anyone who's going to ask difficult questions, such as whether to hold elections. Under normal circumstances, holding elections should not have been considered very difficult questions to deal with. But in a strange country, in a strange situation where Abi Ahmed is the prime minister, holding elections are impediments to be dealt with not part of the repertoire of ordinary exercise of democracy, uh, such as one he promised when he came to office. So what are the implications? We have a prime minister who has all but lost his legitimacy, who has all but lost his, his constituency, who is now facing the most difficult uh, low intensity insurgency as well as popular opposition in Oromia, in the southern region, in many parts, parts of the country. And he wants to use force, and he wants to kill his, his way out of any crisis, whether or not he has the capabilities. Yes, he has the capabilities, as uh, the last three days have made it abundantly clear he's capable of killing hundreds within a matter of two days, or three days, maybe even more. Uh, so he has made a threat with to go ahead with elections. If he continues to entertain the illusion that he can stop us from holding elections through the use of force, that would have serious far-reaching implications on the, not just in the stability, but also in the continuity of the Ethiopian state. Because we'll be fending for ourselves. We'll not allow half-baked authoritarians have picked autocrats such as Abiy Ahmed to stand in the way of our self-determination. That is for all the world to know. Sh the rest of the world should know. And there is no holding back the, t the people of Tigray from holding elections. Of course, come 20 days later. And then, you know, he is using every, every reactionary, enlisting the support of every reactionary, the government of Isaiah Saforki, chauvinists in Amhara region, uh, they are not capable of uh, administering their region, but they are capable of collecting together a bunch of bandits to threaten our peace and stability, to disrupt our elections. But like I said, we'll fend out for, for ourselves. Uh, there are opposition movements in, in, in Oromia, low, inten low intensity insurgency included. There is serious uh, opposition to Abi Ahmed leadership in many parts of the country. If Abi doesn't think twice before he makes those, those dangerous decisions, there is every likelihood that this will lead to the implosion of the country, Ethiopia, as you know it. Uh, Abi is a reformer.
who knows only God knows when. Uh, of course, uh, Isaiah's advice has all, all also uh, been doing magic in Somalia, where Farmajo, who is also uh, part of the, tr the triumvirate in the Horn of Africa region, has decided. to take his advice to extend elections now if, if unless The question is whether Abi uh, is willing to stop listening to um, unhinged people. Well, he's, he's going the unhinged way himself, but uh, like, like Isaiah's, uh, and try to impose his, his, his will through the use of brute force on the people of Ethiopia, uh, he definitely will have decided to preside over the disintegration of the country. Uh, because uh, no Romo will 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 uh, uh, will allow Abiy Ahmed to exercise the kind of uh, authoritarian rule, but at least as far as we're concerned, will never allow that to happen. Uh, what sort of uh, relationship will have? Of course, by the time he decides to make good on his threat to use force, the relationship between uh, Tigray and the Arad Kilo administration will have absolutely been transformed. Uh, what that holds uh, in store for us will remain to be seen. But as far as we're concerned, we take our, our self-determination rights seriously. We are going to hold our elections. Uh, Abi uh, will never allow Abi to exercise, to run roughshod over, over Tigray. And if he is ready to accept that, this would hopefully generate uh, the kind of the level of enthusiasm people would have for elections in any part of the country that would uh, unleash a dynamic uh, that uh, would have difficulty controlling but still it's a still uh, uh, i wouldn't consider it very very late for him to come to, to his senses and realize that nothing is within reach anymore and that he should he should uh, go for a kind of national dialogue uh, that TPLF has been calling for, for, calling for, other progressive forces have been calling for, and any effort on his on his part and on the part of some of his his supporters uh, to roll back on the gains of the multinational federalism uh, are not going to succeed. To the extent that he succeeds, he will have presided over the disintegration mm -hmm. of the country. And my assessment of uh, how things will turn out uh, once Tigray holds its elections are not necessarily sanguine, very unfortunately. But as far as we're concerned, we go ahead with elections. But that doesn't necessarily bode well for the entire country, unless Abi realized that the only game in town is dialogue. Dialogue that gives full faith and credit to the principles uh, enshrined in the Constitution. To the extent that pe people have issues with the Constitution, they can go ahead uh, with amendment of the Constitution through the constitutional means. So uh, as far as we're concerned, we'll hold our elections. We call upon all forces, uh, the Ethiopian people, 
to to stand up for their rights, which they are doing in many parts of the country. And we also advise our erstwhile comrade Abi Ahmed not to make the mortal mistake of trying to make good on his threat to use force against Gray. That will have dire consequences not only on his leadership, but unfortunately, if 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 left unchecked, it will have dire consequences on on the very stability and peace of the entire country, which is already unraveling, thanks due to the excellent. Uh, job that Abi Ahmed has done to destabilize the country which he was supposed to stabilize when he took power. Well, uh, that's all I can say. Mm, thank you. All right, then. Um, the audio was not, uh, uh, it should be, and uh, there were interruptions. I didn't hear what Gitacho most of it and I simply just uh, might repeat some of the things I'll continue uh, so I'm very glad to be, be here amongst you um, and I'll try to be uh, very quick so the topic I'm dealing with is political and constitutional crisis in Ethiopia and some possible scenarios uh, I will uh, probably leave out the constitutional crisis aspect uh, because the current crisis basically is a political crisis uh, that started as a leadership fragmentation first and then uh, and now we are possibly heading towards a political, political legacy, which inevitably uh, would lead to a dictatorial mode of uh, operation uh, sign of them are, signs of them are showing already uh, I would say and the alternative is to that is functional paralysis of state institutions. Uh, it's going to be an either or scenario, uh, either the paralysis or the dictatorship, uh, but neither are sustainable, as uh, you might expect, and more likely than not, we'll end up with a mass opening up for a possibility of disintegration uh, as a result. Now, I'm not saying this is inevitable. We will probably muddle through this one as well, like Ambassador Shin, Shin uh, would say, uh, but it's a real risk nonetheless. Constitutional crisis, I wouldn't characterize that way because uh, as much as it looks as if the constitution is uh, part of the problem, simply because it's frequently mentioned by uh, those who like it and those who don't, I think it's fair to uh, state that there was no problem or conflict in the function of the government or the federation members' regions that the constitution failed to address, resolve, or deliver a solution for. The constitution is not a problem. The constitution itself is a victim of the power actors, uh, say so. And uh, this is not to mean the constitution must stay immune to some change, and I will have some suggestions to that effect later on uh, if time allows. Let me make a point here. Well, contrary to the perception of many, the Ethiopian federal system structured under the organizing principle of identities of nation, nationalities, and peoples, giving them the right to self determination and self identification, which is a component uh, mostly. Uh, mostly ignored, is the most sensible and natural path towards a sustained foundation of nation building. And I think this can be uh, well argued. Why do I say that? In 1991, just before Repair Left took power, there were more than 15 armed organizations fighting in Ethiopia. You might, all of you, uh, remember. Most of them were secessionists. It took the provision of a legislative guarantee for self determination them to be interested to join the political process within Ethiopia. We have a weaker central government now than then, I would say. I understand it has to be established by empirical data, but clearly the difference between the two times is the federal system and the constitution that mirrors uh, identity and the will of the people. Um, the, the most uh, spoken article, Article 39, 
which is not about secession, but self-determination and self-identification uh, in, in, in broader sense, is a centripetal glue that sustains uh, Ethiopia contrary to the portrayal it is often uh, given. Holding everything as is, in today's Ethiopia, I mean, uh, all this suffocation from center, marginalization, sabotaging, hostility, demonization, etc. Keep everything else and remove the self-determination article in the constitution. Can you imagine how hard Tigray would find it to stay within Ethiopia? And same for others. That's where one finds the sense why Tigray taking the right self-determination so serious, and I think it actually was uh, uh, shedding some light on it, so serious and stand its ground and move on with this, uh, uh, its own election. Article 39 is certainly the antithesis of the unitary system, but it is also a uniter. Now, uh, what are the current situations in Ethiopia? Yesterday, New York Times ran a headline, uh, headline like this, uh, Ethiopia protest clashes kill at least uh, dozens. As of late, every day has experienced protesters violence and deaths pretty much for the last five days in the entire Oromia. A week earlier, there was a more lethal and further crackdown in Walaita. And prior to that, during the month of July, there was the Hajalo assassination crisis that was followed by lots of deaths and massive regional wide, uh, region wide destruction. Internet and some media were shut down. Protesters were arrested in mass. Prominent opposition political leaders are jailed now and taken out of the political space. And there were other killings reported in Ben Shangul Gumuz and elsewhere. Um, probably you're familiar with this uh, organization called Armed Conflict uh, Location and Event Data. Uh, it's a US-based uh, organization that uh, tracks conflict locations and events, and then maps them uh, the flashpoints and uh, emerging crisis where violent political disorder was likely to evolve and worsen over the course of the year. So yeah, its elevation is accurate. I could flag a list of 10 countries prone to conflict from the world in the rest half of uh, the 2020, uh, the remaining part of uh, this year. Perhaps not surprisingly, Ethiopia has made it to that list. And uh, there is a figure, uh, let me just uh, share it if I can with you on screen, or, or else I can say it. So, uh, there are 450 reported fatalities only in, uh, since uh, uh, 2020 uh, started, 450 fatalities. And this is uh, before the, the high child crisis. And there were more afterwards as we know it. And 200 uh, political violence and protest events at the same time. Most of them, Noronia, now expanding to many parts of the southern Nation nationalities. And they give you a very, very gloomy picture of the country. So, displacements of hundreds of thousands, failure to recover kidnapped students, inconclusive investigations into series of high profile assassinations, and accusations of serious human rights violations perpetrated by federal forces. Uh, all contributed to concern the Ethiopia's current government. Government seems to be ill-equipped to handle um, at best or complicating the situation at worst. Political maneuvers and policies, weaponizing and mobilizing federal institutions for partisan interests. Again, opponents are further stop tensions. So, uh, with key opposition parties members now jailed, national elections delayed, and ethnic tensions at an all time high, it presents a serious risk of widespread political violence escalating down the road uh, in the remaining part of the year. Federal government security forces are cracking down protesters left and right. Federal government is threatening to guide over the discrimination 
determination to go ahead with its own elections. Stakes are high, lots of tensions and uncertainties have clouded the Ethiopian sky. A group of concerned experts focusing on Ethiopia and affiliated to Freedom House, uh, a member of this group is uh, Professor David Shin, uh, who will be speaking later in this forum, has last week alarmed the world that Ethiopia's past to a more stable and democratic future is increasingly at risk. The recommendations included are all-inclusive dialogue and release of jailed political leaders. Similar alarms were sounded by ICG, um, a little bit less uh, or milder, and others. Probably the worst hit uh, in during this, uh, I mean, the, the, the political aspects and all the crisis, the security issues are, and the election and so forth are being discussed, but the most worst forsaken and the worst hit is the economy during this uh, two year journey of reform period. Uh, as uh, you might know, all the economy used to be the center of attention during the PRDF time. It's also where PRDF shined in, in real success. Uh, it has been a while since the economy became for, for really pushed to a back burner. The success of the PRDF was not picked uh, by the uh, by the uh, post party uh, 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 and the government. It's a lethal combination for a country with growing unemployment rate and huge use belt in the cities, also high level of under underemployment in the world. It's always the case, underemployment is a problem. Ethiopia's economic mainstay, the household level and culture has been uh, forgotten totally. Uh, FDI has shrunk remittance Tourism flow all dwindling, some of them due to the COVID-19, but mainly from the lack of attention and uncertainty. Currently, the usual elusive inflation is showing up uh, again, now standing at 20, uh, and credit worthiness fell recently into the negative outlook. GDP is projected to decline from two to three, I and mean, this has to be uh, one of the, the great uh, loss uh, to, to speak of uh, because uh, during the, uh, the previous years uh, we have been experiencing uh, an interrupted economic growth of uh, some of them uh, going to double digit. So democratization has now become a larger to speak. There was no excuse to postpone the census, population census, but it was postponed anyway. Tigray also protested then too. COVID was not an excuse for that. But COVID has become a very good excuse for deferring the general election. Now, there are countries that did the same. Uh, to, to, to be fair. There are also others who stuck with their election plans. None of them uh, that opted to postpone their national elections did it by breaching the spirit of their constitution and disregarding the outcry of the opposition parties anyway. Either their laws allow them to do that or they amended their laws so that they can post one and they did it by reaching uh, common consensus. Now there are many new elements added complicating the matter even further. The high child assassinations, the killings that followed and the tensions that followed, the confrontations of almost all influential political leaders I think you have continued to add fuel to the fire thereby, making political negotiations all the more elusive, putting the opposition behind bars. Uh, if you have Joao Bacal and national politicians, and the other two, uh, Engineer Hilikal and Iskander, all present and the OLF chief under house arrest reported, who is the uh, prosperity party to negotiate with them. And the whole process was supposed to be. Exactly that, I and mean, uh, uh, we can uh, we can argue that uh, this is uh, this is by design. So stifle the opposition in the center and dismantle the federalist camp in the peripheries, including Oromia. Now we don't hear any more of that camp that we are brought uh, together to get PLF pushed out of federal spaces to Tigray. 
So it looks like mission accomplished. International organizations like the ICD are not helping. Uh, they have understood the whole conflict between the PLF and the uh, Prosperity Party, just the election in Tigray. If Tigray were to postpone, for example, the election now, would things change? Uh, I would argue no. The whole silence of the international community sounded conspiratorial and on the surface that is giving the uh, Prosperity Party the license to continue to go excess on rights and the people. No travel advisories are uh, coming out as they used to be in uh, even um, milder and uh, uh, less fatal situations in the earlier times of the APIF. So the Freedom House Group were uh, it's in the statement that I mentioned earlier. Now, do we have scary days ahead? Yes, but it's even scarier if nothing changes to fix it in time. So, that's most probably the likely scenario I envision to happen. So, it has to be better start now than later. Uh, otherwise, I don't say fix to the crisis past September unless some sort of pass is negotiated and settled among the parties until the next election. So how does it start? Well, probably by stating the intention, uh, releasing political prisoners and turning down the hostile rhetoric. Like the PM said, Tigray can go ahead with its regional elections and uh, they are determined to go anyway. Gita uh, has told us just a minute, uh, some, some minutes earlier. It's not causing any political or constitutional incompatibility with any fix that comes that uh, that needs to come later. The government can fill its institutions to observe the process uh, if it wishes to. Uh, I wouldn't think Tigray would mind because uh, they were even uh, asking for help uh, for the uh, national board to facilitate it. It can be harmonized with the countrywide election uh, if to happen later. So that's not a problem. Okay, so if I have uh, a couple of minutes, uh, I will go to some uh, new uh, suggestions uh, on how to really um, add new sensibilities to the existing uh, federal uh, and the constitution of the, the, of the day. Uh, so how do we say it? Because it looks like uh, the constitution has some rules for amendments and uh, there seems to be a stiff uh, structure, uh, so to say. So uh, the idea should be about bringing uh, representation and then stability so that uh, changes can continue, to, can, can continue to happen within uh, a continuity uh, of the country. So, uh, in representation, everyone needs to feel they are represented. That's, uh, that's very obvious. Stability, that no one should feel threatened by the tyranny of the majority, nor from a pressure by a candidate alone, large group, nor a destabilization you know, because of uh, a head-on collision between two such groups. So uh, it can be done either in, in a negotiated uh, consensus or it can be uh, included in the uh, in the constitution as a, as an amendment so everyone counts and is helped that's uh, the representation part the representation part this often is expressed through voting for the representative but in a democratic system that does not guarantee minorities an equal say even a say for that matter where majority rules mr Pian's case the current constitution the house of Representatives, does ensure each 1000 hundred 100,000 or so people for distinct minorities less than that number in the House of Federation, that they are represented with one arm of the federal court. But large states, particularly Yamaha and Oromia, dominate and can set any agenda in, the, in their favor. The House of Federation, consisting of states, does provide states some leeway in limiting pressure from one single state, but does not guarantee if a majority of the states want to frustrate other states. The role of the majority, a gang of small states can frustrate Amara and Gormia. So need some modification in the likes of, of similar to filibuster here uh, practice in the US. So current representation is good, but not adequate. 
what what can we bring to really uh, ensure stability with the majority having their way and the minorities feeling the legacy of uh, defranchisement and continuing disillusionment and powerlessness, minorities have resorted to find security in their own police and the armed forces. Armed states will continue to be assertive against a weak neighbor and threaten the stability of the federal arena, and even the power of the federal government. So what is the incentive that will prevent minorities from doing so? Uh, I own the price, the promise of a guaranteed shot at the three ultimate power positions, the premiership, the speaker of the house, and the presidium of the house of the federation. Since the two majority nations, Amara and Romania, are well represented in the house of uh, representatives, also, of, of course, as well as in the house of the federation, albeit equally with the minority states, where they can set control and dictate almost all the affairs and resources of the country and channel such resources towards their constituencies, they have no real need for the power of the executive. So that should be, leave, uh, that should be reserved for these uh, minorities uh, to ensure stability. On the other hand, the minorities can not set the agenda even if all of them gang up. Very unlikely scenario. And worse, with very few seats in the house. So, have very little chance to securing any of the one of the three ultimate power seats and most probably the executive office of the premiership. On the other hand, if the three power seats were exclusively allotted for minority seats when they get a turn, not only would have they to work hard and lobby to get support of most of the minorities, but will also be forced to get the support of at least one of the majority constituents, which in turn would have to get some of the Form of concession or kickback to rally the necessary votes to secure support. Well, uh, there could be some elements added to assure insurance uh, and confidence, uh, but in the interest of time, I will, I will stop here and uh, thank you very much. I'm waiting for someone to give me the signal to, uh, to go forward here. Uh, first, I, let me uh, thank the organizers uh, of this event today. And because I'm speaking from uh, Washington and I don't know what the signal quality is, uh, if you, someone could let me know if you're not hearing me at some point so I don't keep speaking um, with no one understanding what I am saying. So somehow uh, give me a, a wave or something so that I know whether to stop and start over again. Uh, I'm going to look at um, the international relationships with Ethiopia, focusing particularly on the United States, but I'll talk uh, briefly about some of the other important countries that interact with Ethiopia. Uh, being in Washington and very far away from what is happening in Ethiopia, uh, it doesn't make much sense for me to try to analyze uh, events on the ground in Ethiopia. I'm not close enough to the, to the action and I'm not in a strong enough position to talk intelligently about that. So let me let me start with the United States, and I'll be very frank, uh, is how I see the current relationship. And it's important to keep in mind that the United States is right now in the middle of a very important election, which is basically consuming all of the oxygen in the air uh, when it comes to international relations. And I would have to say that um, there is very little interest in the United States today in terms of what is happening in Ethiopia uh, above the level of the Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs. Uh, from that level on down, there is interest and in our people who are following the situation closely. But when you get above that level, quite frankly, I don't see uh, people focusing on what is happening in Ethiopia. 
It was a small, dedicated group of members of Congress who do follow uh, sporadically events in Ethiopia. But even Congress is um, preoccupied with the elections at the moment. And between now and November 3, our election date, uh, and for that matter, even into November, when the new president will, or a president will be installed, uh, it's going to be very difficult to uh, get any uh, attention uh, to Ethiopia, or for that matter, most countries around the world. Uh, I would point out that both U.S. secretaries of state under the Trump administration have visited Ethiopia, but that was as much for their uh, engagement with the African Union as it was for the bilateral relationship with Ethiopia. There was, as you all know, some high-level U.S. Um, involvement early this year uh, to engage on the issue of the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam uh, based on talks in Washington led by Secretary, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin involving the World Bank and involving um, key personnel from Ethiopia, Sudan, and Egypt. But that too was driven more by the U.S.-Egypt relationship than it was the U.S.-Ethiopian relationship. That uh, whole effort was uh, a result of a specific request by President el-Sisi to President Trump uh, to mediate the uh, issue of the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. Uh, Secretary Mnuchin happened to be at that meeting, and that's why he was uh, designated as the person to lead the effort. Normally, the Department of State would lead this effort because there is some expertise on the GERD and on Nile water issues in the State Department. Uh, as far as I know, there's almost no expertise on this topic in the Treasury Department. And so I was totally perplexed as to why um, the Treasury Department would be in the lead on this issue. Uh, well, the reason for it is simply that Mnuchin was in the meeting with LCC and the President asked Mnuchin to take control of it. As you all know, after several meetings, uh, that effort went nowhere. Uh, it has essentially been put aside in the role of the U.S. in the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam issue now is a very limited one. Uh, it's nothing more than having an observer present at the African Union meetings, which quite frankly may be a better outcome. Uh, I'm not sure that the United States was ever well-placed uh, to deal with this issue. But since then, of course, the elections have taken over the political um, atmosphere in Washington. Everyone is focused on what is uh, going on uh, between the, um, the Trump uh, group and the Biden group. Uh, if you have a, a situation where uh, Trump wins the election. I think you will see more of the same in terms of the Ethiopia-U.S. relationship. I would not expect any particular difference. On the other hand, if you have a Biden victory, I, I think at a minimum there will be more attention given uh, to Ethiopia than we have seen over the last four years. That is more higher level attention. There, there are other groups uh, that uh, that Edesta alluded to that are are active in the United States that look are looking at the Ethiopia U.S. relationship. One is led by the Freedom House uh, organization, which is a civil society organization. Another is led by the U.S. Institute of Peace. These are both relatively small groups, so maybe 20 individuals in each of the groups. Some of the persons are overlapping, 
uh, in both the one organized by Freedom House and the one organized by the U.S. Institute of Peace. I happen to be involved with both of them. Uh, but these are groups that do not have any particular traction with the Trump administration. They're, they're, they do not have government officials in them. They're simply what I would call the friends of Ethiopia, uh, who would like to see a, uh, a satisfactory democratic outcome to what is, um, is happening and a peaceful outcome to what is happening in Ethiopia today. Uh, they're also looking for a unified Ethiopia, not one that breaks down into many different parts. Uh, the major uh, goal of the Freedom House group was to urge uh, serious, comprehensive political dialogue among all parties in Ethiopia uh, uh, to try to move forward uh, as this uh, election has been postponed at the national level and an effort to try to reach some kind of accommodation and ideally a date for when that election can be held rather than leaving it open-ended. Uh, these are all tough issues and um, I, I, uh, I don't mean to be too um, negative in terms of the U.S. role at this point, but it is important to be realistic about where the U.S. stands and the fact that it is consumed with an election process. Uh, having said that, it is important to, um, to keep in mind that the United States is the largest provider of bilateral assistance to Ethiopia. That's simply a fact. And over the past 20 years, uh, the United States aid to Ethiopia has totaled more than 13 billion dollars, that's billion with a B, and in just the last five years, it has totaled four billion dollars. And these are grants, they're not loans. This is not money that has to be repaid. Uh, so the United States is still a very important actor in, in Ethiopian um, development and Ethiopian humanitarian affairs. Uh, let me just move on briefly to the European Union-Ethiopia relationship. In my view, the Ethiopian Union is, uh, has always um, been sort of taken for granted, and it has never received the credit that it deserves in terms of how it serves as a development partner for Ethiopia. And I think that's unfortunate. Um, it may be that the European Union does not play as much of a political role in Ethiopia as it might, uh, but it is a very critical development partner. Between 2014 and 2020, the European Union provided development aid valued at 815 million euros and from 2015 to 2019, the European Union Emergency Trust Fund provided an additional 271 million euros. And again, this is grant aid. These are not loans that have to be repaid to the European Union. So it's very important to keep in mind the role of the European Union in Ethiopian affairs. Uh, the European Union is not consumed with elections at the moment, so arguably they may be in a stronger position than the United States in, in the next several months anyway, to play some kind of, um, of useful role in the country. Uh, the the China-Ethiopia relationship is an important one. As some of you may know, I spend a lot of time dealing with China-Africa issues. I'm currently writing another book on the topic. Uh, China is a major development partner with Ethiopia. It's also Ethiopia's largest trading partner by far. So one cannot dismiss the role of China in Ethiopia. But most of this partnership is based on loans. And it admittedly is a major source of financial support for Ethiopia, but the, majority, the vast majority of this is in the category of loans. 
which means that today China holds about 40% of Ethiopia's debt. Uh, that's a pretty huge percentage of the debt held. Now, China has rescheduled some of that debt so that it can be paid at a later date. I, I don't know all the terms of the debt rescheduling, uh, and that's a good thing. But the fact is, it is still uh, on the record as having to be repaid. And even the trade relationship with Ethiopia is one that Ethiopia needs to be careful about because it's the largest trade relationship, but it is overwhelmingly Chinese exports to Ethiopia, not Ethiopian exports to China, which means that there is a huge uh, Ethiopian trade deficit with China. Uh, just a brief comment on Russia, Ethiopia. In years in the past, uh, Russia had a very important relationship with Ethiopia, particularly back in the days when it was the Soviet Union. Uh, as all of you know, uh, Prime Minister Abiy attended the very highly publicized Russia-Africa summit in Sochi uh, this past October. I, but I would simply ask you, uh, what has happened in terms of the Russia-Ethiopia relationship since the Sochi summit. I'm hard pressed to identify anything of any significance that has occurred there. So yes, Russia is an important player, but I don't see Russia doing much in Ethiopia. Uh, the Gulf states are other important players in, the, uh, in Ethiopia. In fact, they're important players throughout the Horn of Africa. But if you look at their engagement, um, in the region, there it's a positive engagement from the standpoint of their investments in Ethiopia and other Horn of African countries, and I give them credit for that. Uh, but the, on the political side, it has not necessarily been a very helpful engagement. Uh, you have a couple of things going on that make the situation more difficult in the Horn of Africa. You have Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates that are very much um, opposed to Iran, and they have now carried that dispute into the Horn of Africa, uh, trying to encourage the Horn of African countries to break relations with Iran, and some have done that. Uh, this is an area where I think Ethiopia has played a fairly intelligent policy. They have basically stayed out of that conflict between uh, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates on the one hand and Iran on the other. There's just no need to be dragged into uh, Gulf and Middle East disputes if you can possibly avoid it. Another part of the Gulf situation is the, uh, the Turkey and Qatar relationship, which is opposed to Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. Uh, this has had less of an impact on Ethiopia than it has had on countries like Somalia, but nevertheless, uh, it's a situation that impacts Ethiopia too. And here too, I would give credit to Ethiopia for staying out of this conflict. There's no need to jump in the middle of a Qatar, Turkey versus Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates dispute. I realize some of these countries have money to spend in places like Ethiopia, and they like to use that money to achieve their own goals. But the further that Ethiopia can stay out of these disputes, the better off it will be. Uh, let me just conclude with a, uh, a, a comment about a country that you hear little about in Ethiopia, and one that I would like to hear more about, because it's a very important country in the wider region, and it potentially, I think, has useful lessons for countries like Ethiopia, and that's India. Uh, India is the second most populous country in the world. Uh, economically, it's doing quite well. Uh, it does have important investments in Ethiopia, and that's good, but there is um, surprisingly little activity 
in my view, between India and Ethiopia. And I think this is a case where both countries, both India and Ethiopia, need to step up their game. Uh, not that it's going to have any impact upon internal political developments in Ethiopia, but it still can be a positive relationship uh, to strengthen ties with the world's largest democracy, which is what India is today. So I would hope uh, to see more of India getting engaged in, uh, in Ethiopia in the coming months. I'm going to stop there, hope that I've, I've been able to add something to your discussion today and look forward to uh, hearing uh, the remarks coming up and, and particularly from my friend Matt Bryden, who I assume will tell us more about the regional relationships in the country. Thank you for hearing me out. Hello, good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? Good. Um, I think I think uh, in that case, if uh, I can be I can be heard and seen. Um, greetings from Nairobi, Kenya, where unfortunately at this time of day, the um, internet sometimes cuts out. So I apologize in advance if that happens. Um, but I would first like to express my gratitude to the organizers um, and to all of you who joined for being um, uh, for letting me be part of this very you know fascinating engrossing conversation. Um, I I have been asked to speak to um, the regional developments, um, the impact on peace, peace and security. Um, but of course, my focus is. Um, and my specialization over the years, as some of you may know, has been Somalia. Um, and so I'll be looking at the region um, almost through a Somali lens and uh, hope that that will nevertheless um, provoke some thoughts about what it means for Ethiopia um, and for the region as a whole. Um, so to begin with, um, I think it's, you know, it's critical to understand the scale of the, the turbulence and the, the type of transition that the Horn of Africa, and I'll use the EGAD member states, uh, including Eritrea, um, you know, for that, for that definition. Um, uh, I would say six out of eight of EGAD's members are facing um, significant political uh, and or constitutional transitions um, within the next uh, few months or uh, at most within the next, say, two years. Um, we have uh, Ethiopia uh, with, uh, as, as we've heard, uh, a very contentious and disputed uh, political transition uh, underway and uh, an indefinite uh, path forward. Um, we have Somalia, uh, which is supposed to begin an electoral process in October uh, that will deliver a new president um, by February next year. And that process as well has divided the country um, along many axes and uh, is likely to result in um, a new dispensation next year, um, whether it's um, more divided or more united, we'll, we'll get back to. Uh, of course, Sudan is in the midst of a transition, um, a fairly well-organized one in the sense that it has a large degree of buy-in uh, from many of the, or from most of the actors. We have South Sudan, which is struggling uh, from one transition to the next. Um, and um, I'd say, although we don't yet have a transition in sight, Eritrea uh, will at some point uh, face a succession challenge. Uh, and to, to the best of my knowledge, um, there is no political process or architecture in place 
uh, in Eritrea to manage uh, an unexpected transition. So um, if you think about it, um, it makes for very interesting times and it, and it makes us, um, you know, keeps us all very busy just trying to, to follow the news cycle and to make our contributions um, in our different ways. But it also creates an, an, a global um, sense of uncertainty and I think uh, a lack of, of, of confidence uh, in terms of the political foundations on which this region is based. It, it leads us to short-term thinking uh, when uh, almost you know, six out of eight of the governments or most of the governments of this region um, are not in a position to make long-term commitments um, because uh, they may not be here uh, in um, you know, a year or in a few months' time, or they may be consumed by domestic crises, um, or any commitments that they enter into, contrary to uh, standard international practice and norms, might not be respected by the next administration because there is a change, a constitutional change, or a, for want of a better term, a regime change, that means that uh, continuity from one government to the next um, becomes uh, interrupted um, or is not respected. And so uh, when we think about you know, strategic issues, the bigger challenges facing this region, uh, the, Nile, the Nile waters issue, um, the issues of uh, infrastructure and economic integration uh, that IGAD has been instrumental in trying to promote um, in collective security and fighting against um, a range of, of threats, including um, but not only uh, terrorism, of course, then um, it's very difficult to build frameworks uh, for cooperation and for um, collaboration uh, if uh, the rotation of political leadership um, is, is at the moment almost like a, a revolving door as we go around the region. Um, and in this, in this context, I think for most of the past 30 years, as you know, in Ethiopia has been described as an anchor state. Uh, it was um, stable. Uh, wherever one sits or stands in terms of the political, uh, domestic political spectrum in Ethiopia, um, it was a point of reference. Um, friends and adversaries alike knew what the Ethiopian government's position was, um, had a sense of um, stability um, and predictability in terms of uh, what Ethiopia, um, how Ethiopia would react in a given situation. And there were also very well-established long-standing relationships between um, Ethiopia and agencies in Ethiopia and, and agencies and services ministries in neighboring countries, and the region as a whole um, had fallen into, um, I think, a quite comfortable and, uh, if not entirely effective, at least a, um, um, a good enough um, mode of functioning uh, and resolving problems and coming together to, um, to try and take the, the region forward. So if Ethiopia was the anchor state, Somalia, for most of the last three decades, has been um, the cockpit. It has been the vacuum, the failed state, um, in which many of the conflicts of the region and even beyond the region, um, these conflicts have been played out by proxy. And this has had an impact, not just in Somalia itself, but then in the way developments of Somalia tie into uh, the wider region. So let me let me say a little bit about um, where we stand in Somalia right now. Um, the country adopted uh, a federal constitution in 2004, and at the time there was really no consensus among Somalis uh, on the adoption of federalism. It was seen very much as an imposition of um, the anointed president at the time, Abdullah Yusuf, who was the president uh, 
previously of Somalia's first federal member state, Puntland, and behind him, Ethiopia as a country that um, favored the federal model and was promoting it um, for Somalia, if not imposing it. And yet there was a large constituency of Somalis opposed to it. And much of the last decade um, has been, has played out as a kind of pendulum with um, political uh, leadership or advantage swinging between groups that are pro-federal and anti-federal um, and um, those that are pro-federal tended to be uh, more on the periphery of Somalia. The unitarists tended to be uh, closer to Mogadishu and the center, uh, perceived center of power. And uh, there was also another dimension, which was that Islamist groups tended to identify with the unionists um, rather than the federalists. And so all of these interests sort of combined and conflated meant that Somalia has been swinging between successive transitional governments um, up until the present day. Now, we don't call Somalia's current government a transitional government, but the fact is it's based on a provisional constitution, which means it is de facto and de jure um, a provisional government uh, whose powers remain largely undefined and the constitution on which it's based has left open um, the, the definition of the federal architecture. And while the constitution is very messy and unclear on most things, many things, uh, one um, article of intent in the constitution is unmistakable. And that is that the completion of the, ar of the federal architecture um, and therefore of the constitution itself, the distribution of power and resources between the federal government, federal member states. Um, these kinds of issues are to be resolved through negotiation between the federal leadership and the federal member states. It's to be a consultative, collaborative, and consensus-oriented process. But what's happened over the past almost four years under the current administration of, of President Mohamed Abdullahi Farmajo, is that um, the federal government has worked um, aggressively to centralize and monopolize power and resources in Mogadishu at the expense of the federal member states. And um, many Somalis would say to undermine um, the very concept of federalism and introduce a, a system of government that is um, at least de facto um, controlled from Mogadishu and, and is unitary. Um, this has set up the country for dangerous tensions. Um, we have particularly the, uh, the northern state of Puntland and the southern state of Jubaland um, deeply opposed to the unitary model. We have uh, three central states closer to Mogadishu, the southwest, Hirshabeli and Galmuduk, um, that are more accommodating of the federal government, um, but in large part because they are dependent on the federal government for uh, their economic survival. And so what we see is that publicly they stand together as a block with Jubaland and Puntland on the other side. Um, you know, sometimes changing depending on, on the issues. Um, but in private, uh, the leadership are very clear that they're concerned about uh, power being usurped uh, by the capital, by the federal leadership, and, um, and uh, that they are not in favor of dismantling federalism. Um, <clears throat> all of this is coming to a head because Somalia is about to go through a transition between October and February. Uh, 2021. So the upper house of parliament's mandate expires um, in October, the lower house between October and November, and then the president's mandate comes to an end on the 8th of February. Um, and the opposition, which includes uh, several federal member states and some of the major um, political groups and clan groups in and around the capital, Mogadishu, have made it very clear that they will not accept 
that the federal government, and that means essentially the president, um, since he fired his prime minister uh, a couple of weeks ago and did not replace him yet. Um, so for the moment, it's the president and uh, the sitting parliament will not be allowed to remain one day longer than their current mandates allow. Um, so a highly polarized situa situation, highly charged. And um, this has brought in um, the region and, of course, um, governments beyond the region. Um, whether by accident or by design, they find themselves on one side or the other of this struggle between federalists and unitarists and the competition to control the political transition, the upcoming transition, uh, to predetermine the outcome in favor of one or the other. Uh, the biggest and uh, most dramatic uh, change in terms of Somalia's relationship with the region has been the position of Ethiopia. Uh, Ethiopia was, as I said earlier, uh, in, perceived as the architect of Somali federalism, had promoted it, had excellent relations with the federal member states and uh, before them with the authorities that, that established those states and was always um, uh, perhaps cordial in its relations with Mogadishu, but always careful to ensure a balance that, that Mogadishu did not become um, overwhelmingly powerful. And um, by supporting the federal member states, some Somalis saw that as a way of keeping the Somali state weak, divided, fragmented, um, whereas others saw it as a, a, a need to balance overweening um, authoritarianism um, that had destroyed the state under Mohammed Siad Bare uh, and, and ensured some kind of balance of power among the different parts of the country. Ethiopia has, over the last three years, been uh, one of the most important backers of the federal government and challengers of the federal member states. It's a 180 degree shift. And so has, whereas Ethiopia is uh, very welcome and has an excellent relationship at the t level of national leadership between Addis and Mogadishu, um, Ethiopian forces uh, on the ground in Somalia, in the southwest state, in Jubaland, um, and in, uh, in parts of uh, central Somalia, have found themselves suddenly subjects of suspicion, um, less welcome. Uh, we've seen more frequent attacks by Al-Shabaab uh, because the communities themselves have stopped cooperating the way they used to, have stopped providing intelligence, and are more permissive uh, to Al-Shabaab since they no longer see Ethiopia the way, uh, the, the way that they used to, um, and instead as promoting an anti-federal um, agenda. <clears throat> uh, similarly, um, the relationship, uh, the rapprochement between Ethiopia and Eritrea has meant that Eritrea has returned um, uh, to the Somali arena, uh, in which it was involved until about 2009, um, and has uh, been assisting in the training of Somali troops, and um, apparently providing or has been part of the political uh, consultation between the three leaders, uh, Prime Minister Abiy uh, and uh, President Farmajo and, and of course President Sayas, um, in terms of what direction they collectively want to take. Um, this has had a knock-on effect in terms of Ethiopia's relationship with Kenya, um, not the Eritrean component, but Ethiopia's switch in terms of federalism in Somalia means that where Ethiopia and Kenya used to see eye to eye, especially on the southwest state of Jubaland, um, where both have troops, um, they are now supporting uh, opposing factions with Kenya supporting the Jubaland government of Ahmed Madobe, Ethiopia supporting the federal government, which has removed the Jubaland administration from, from part of its territory and replaced it with direct 
uh, rule or administration from Mogadishu. And we even saw the um, egregious situation um, about a year ago now of Ethiopian and Kenyan troops um, in a standoff at Kismayo Airport, um, face to face, locked and loaded, um, with the risk of, of one stray shot being fired, bringing two historical allies into conflict over um, over what? Um, one piece of territory in Somalia. I, I just think I ask you to reflect that for either country is that historical partnership of over half a century um, worth putting at risk uh, for um, the status of Jubaland or for even for um, the viability of uh, President Farmajo's government. Um, it, the, the calculus behind that is, you know, the, the logic is really hard to understand. Um, at the same time, for different reasons, Kenya and Djibouti having difficulties, uh, particularly the competition over the United uh, Nations Security Council seat. And then as um, Ambassador Shin mentioned, we have the whole Middle Eastern situation and the UAE and Qatar uh, both having played a role in, uh, in Somalia. Although um, for the better part of two years, uh, I would submit that the United Arab Emirates has essentially withdrawn. Um, it has very limited interests in Somalia now or investments. Uh, the, in the port of Berbera in Somaliland, uh, the port of uh, Bosaso in um, in Puntland, and some residual links with uh, uh, the federal member states, but um, it's not a major player at the moment. So the real um, the real power players in Somalia, um, other than Ethiopia, um, are Qatar and Turkey. Uh, who are aligned with the Farmajo government and are also seen as promoting this a very centralistic, um, autocratic and top-down um, approach to government. All of this, these divisions, these, these fractions and tensions um, have got implications for, um, I think, one, inside Somalia, of course, for the African Union's um, presence in Somalia, uh, its mission there, which is supposed to, to leave uh, in roughly a year and hand over to Somali security forces. Um, so Somalia would become a fully sovereign country again. And then it also they also have um, an impact for uh, the IGAD region and uh, the, the neighboring states. I'm gonna run quickly through that, being conscious of the time. Uh, first of all, the, the transition plan in which we are supposed to see Amazon draw down and Somali security forces step up is, um, is at an impasse. It really has not made uh, anything like the progress it should have made against its, its defined benchmarks at this stage. And what we're seeing in Somalia is actually quite alarming. It's a proliferation of forces and a fragmentation of forces. First, we have Amazon itself, where if you consider that the contingents are from Ethiopia, Kenya, Djibouti, um, also Uganda and Burundi, but Ethiopia, Kenya and Djibouti with the uh, tensions between uh, those, those governments in, in different respects, uh, makes it very hard to have a unified command and control uh, headquarters um, on the ground and there are routine complaints that the forces on the ground actually report to their capitals and not to the Amazon force headquarters in Mogadishu. So Amazon um, not only um, tested, strained, but also um, in no position to withdraw because on the other side, the Somali forces are even more uh, chaotic. Uh, we are seeing almost the bifurcation of the Somali security sector between those Somali National Army and police supported by the West, the Americans, the EU, um, and then another uh, set of military units and police supported by, uh, trained by Turkey, supported by Qatar. And um, 
we see, I, I think it's fair to say that uh, we see that the federal government considers the Qatari Turkish trained forces to be more loyal and uses them for political purposes. Uh, whereas the Western trained forces are essentially disposable and are sent on missions that uh, often seem to, um, to achieve very little. What I mean by that is that writ large, the federal government has spent more time fighting the, the administrations of the federal member states than it has fighting Al-Shabaab. And there are a number of examples we could go into, but um, the key here is that when fighting the federal member states, we see the uh, Turkish trained forces, what are called Turksom, um, and their special forces, which are called Eagle or Gorgor, um, and the Turkish trained special police, paramilitary police known as the Cheetahs or the Haramaad. Those tend to be the instruments of political control that can be counted on by the federal government to undermine uh, the federal member states. The Western trained units are sent on missions against Al Shabaab. Uh, for which there seems to be very little priority. Um, and as part of this transition plan, uh, they are, you know, goals are set, missions are assigned, and yet there's almost zero forward movement over the last four or five years. As an example, um, this year, uh, an operation called uh, Badbado or Salvation uh, was. Uh, uh, one phase of it was completed in Lower Shabele, just southwest of Mogadishu, and uh, the town of Janale was taken um, at the end of that that operation. Um, and it was touted in the media, if you look online, as a major victory. Uh, if you look back historically, you'll also see that um, uh, Somali national forces and AMISOM uh, actually held Janale until 2014, and that the same operation has been repeated four times between 2014 and 2020. Badbado has been done four times to recapture the same 65 kilometers of territory. Um, every year or two, it has to be done again because troops are sent out, abandoned, supply lines um, fail, payment isn't made, attrition takes place, and, um, and more Western trained troops are thrown in once again to, to repeat the, the same exercise. So um, we're not seeing the kind of domestic security forces in Somalia that are gonna be needed uh, for Somalia to stand up as, as a sovereign state um, and to play its part, not just in maintaining its own security, but in maintaining his, the security of the region uh, by containing the Al-Shabaab threat where it, where it uh, originates, which is in Somalia itself. Um, so I think this is, this is where I'll conclude is the, the, these, the situation in Somalia, because of the way it is, it's interlinked with the rest of the region, um, is a threat, not just to the Somali people themselves, uh, and to Somalia's existence as a state, but, but also to the neighbors and also in a lesser degree to the, to the wider international community. So what could be a way forward? Um, Basically, we have, I think by early next year, uh, the choices for Somalia are twofold. Either we will have a some kind of contested electoral process or just a decision for an extension. Um, but as of, as of last night, um, the federal government and its allies agreed on a model for an indirect election that in theory should happen by February. Um, so if that election takes place, um, it will be recognized by some parts of Somalia, some federal member states, some communities, and rejected by others who were not at the meeting at which it was concocted and who see the whole process as being uh, controlled, manipulated uh, by the federal authorities. So there we end up with a divided Somalia. How divided? Um, I don't want to predict. The, the worst case scenario is that uh, we have a government that is um, effective, has effective authority in parts of the country as it does today. And yet if um, Puntland, Jubaland um, remain opposed, um, 
you add to that the territory held by al-shabaab and if you add to that somaliland you've probably got 70 percent of the country the territory that is beyond um, government control if not more than that so one option is we go ahead with either um, a unilateral term extension of the government or the appearance of a rigged election uh, which divides the country further and um, you can imagine also then uh, forces Somalia's neighbors and patrons to decide which side of this dispute they're on um, and, and further creates um, tensions within the region. The alternative, I think, is some kind of negotiated consensus-oriented transition. Um, it's really not possible to hold, um, uh, to get a political agreement and to organize credible elections that will be widely accepted uh, between now and October when the upper house is of uh, parliament is supposed to be re-elected, uh, the lower house a month later, and then February perhaps, for the, but the February election is just parliament electing the president, so that's easy. Um, the hard part is having a parliamentary election by October, and there is uh, very little, um, if anything, in place to make that possible, uh, whether in terms of security, infrastructure, personnel, and preparation. Um, and the so if if we're not if we're not able to have that type of election, um, then the the region is going to have to prepare uh, either for the divisions to continue and possibly deepen, and in a worst case scenario, include attempts military attempts to oust uh, the incumbent government from Mogadishu uh, by some of the factions there that oppose it, um, or uh, I'm I'm afraid not not a very palatable option, uh, but some form of caretaker government negotiated between uh, the federal government as it stands um, and uh, the federal member states and other major stakeholders. There are some political parties. Uh, there are the two houses of parliament that might uh, need to be involved. But basically what used to be called the National Leaders Forum, coming together and agreeing on how to um, bridge the gap between the end of this government's mandate and uh, some form of election that is going to be um, agreed in advance, uh, credible, and its results uh, accepted by uh, a critical mass, if not the majority of the Somali people. So I'll stop there. And thanks very much to all of you for bearing with me and, and listening in. Thank you. Uh Th th thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Matthew, for your presentation. Uh, just to highlight what you have said of, uh, over the last 20 minutes. Uh, you try to look into the domestic politics of uh, you try to look into the domestic politics of Eritrea. Uh, Somalia and Ethiopia. Uh, you also highlighted the involvement of di uh, different actors in Somalia politics, especially the Turkish involvement, uh, the Western countries' involvement, and you try to highlight the purpose why they are involved in, uh, in the politics of Somalia. You also try to look into the uh, in Eritrea and is viewed from abroad, especially in terms of its uh, uh, stability and predictability, and uh, its role in establishing peace in the neighboring countries. These were the major points that you've raised. Uh, I now open the floor for further discussion, and I invite the online, uh, online participants uh, to raise any question, either uh, uh, with regard to the first, second or third presenter or with regard to uh, Matthew's uh, paper. So anyone who is interested to raise any question will be welcomed. Uh, 
Anyone who, is in, who would like to participate, please raise your hand. Right. Uh, I'll start with Gabriel Tyler Mariam. He will be the number one to participate. And next, next will be uh, uh, next will be Ambassador Fisa and and third will be Hatsbaha and. Hello, Gabriel, can you hear me? Can you unmute the sound system, please? Okay. Uh, how do you continue on the next part? Uh, yeah. Okay. That's what. That's what I smack up. You Okay. You can start. Okay. Thank you. So my question is uh, going for Mr. Geta Chowreda. First, first of all, I would thank for the members of the committee for having uh, the, the participants together. Uh, it was really a nice uh, presentation, a nice stage. So, Mr. Getacho, if you if you can hear me, uh, the issue of self determination in Tigray now is an exist existential threat. So, this is matter of uh, life and death for the Tigrayans, and that is, that is why all the the Tigrayan public, the Tigrayan uh, elite, and everybody in Tigray is defend defending for it. So that's good. We are defending for it, and uh, by hook or by crook, we are going to assure our self-determination uh, by blood or by, 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 by everything necessary. So th th that 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 is quite sure now. We are uh, uh, our political parties, members of political parties, the uh, the, the government, the ruling uh, political parties are defending uh, for the Tigrayans' self-determination. So my, 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 my fear is how much this self-determination can be uh, uh, continued if it should not be uh, stopped after uh, the upcoming election comes to an end. So what is your, your reflection on that? Thank you very much. Hello, Getacho, can you hear me? 
Did you get the first question? Hello? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. You can continue. Uh, all right. I, well, I, I think, you know, the, the whole issue of uh, uh, in, taking care of the um, self-governing or self-determination rights of Tigray is not just about election. Election is only one facet of uh, the exercise of the right to self-determination. Ultimate self-determination uh, should translate into self-government that uh, ensures the full participation of the public uh, in all walks of political life. It involves uh, holding, even in the case of holding elections, it involves holding elections in a free, fair, and democratic manner. In a manner that is uh, credible, in a manner that uh, that uh, wins uh, the support of uh, the larger public, including, of course, uh, those who have voted for the opposition, no matter what the results uh, are going to turn out to be. So, for us, the only insurance policy against relapse, as uh, far as unnecessary, um, say. Um, authoritarian uh, tendencies is to make sure that the participation of the public in the upcoming elections is said that um, the elections are held in a free, democratic, and credible uh, fashion. Uh, and the people of Tigray, when we say they take care of their self-determination quite seriously, it simply means they wouldn't settle for anything less than an exemplary uh, election. That will, of course, help erect a government that is fully legitimate, that uh, fully answers to the aspirations of its people. So the only insurance policy we have against this is for the people to continue to, to be seized with the money, uh, for the people to continue to exercise their hard-won rights uh, in a manner that puts uh, any uh, government in office on their choice, and they have to do everything with power to, to meet the aspirations of the, the, the people. But I don't think there should be any fear of, um, say, uh, the self-determination rights or self government rights of uh, uh, the people of Tigray being uh, either abandoned or uh, being rolled back uh, after the elections, because the elections ultimately are about uh, establishing a government a legitimate one that fully uh, meets the aspirations of its people. Short of that, no amount of uh, election is going to count uh, for anything. So the people of Tigray know better than settling for anything less than anything to come. So, well, ultimately, it is the people who will have to guarantee and who will guarantee the continuity of uh, this unassailable constitutional right, this unassailable hard won right of self government and self determination. Thank you. Gabriel, what, can you hear me? Th thank you, Getacho, for the answer. Uh, Gabriel, what, I will be the next to uh, ask any question. Can you hear me? Right, you can come now. Okay, the, thank you very much for organizers and for presenters. I have uh, some questions. My question is uh, goes to David uh, Shane. Uh, David raised uh, a lot of things about the political and international developments in the Horn of Africa vis-a-vis -vis of the uh, 
uh, US relation. And uh, concerning to this, I want to ask him why didn't why why you don't rise the ETO Eritrea uh, 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 relation or the no after the no or no peace uh, the uh, Donald Yamamoto was a broker in uh, reconciling the uh, Eritrean president and uh, uh, and uh, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed uh, so. What are the the uh, the enigmatic uh, contents of this uh, relationship? Because at the grassroots level, the people's uh, the people's relationship is not recovered, and even the border is as uh, it was there. So, what is the secret behind the Ethiopia Eritrea relationship? Uh, uh, because the peace is remain at the elite level. That means. Uh, among uh, 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 Eritrean president and uh, Ethiopian prime minister, so could you uh, could you uh, tell us something about uh, this uh, Ethiopia Eritrea rapportment? And the second is uh, the, second, the sec my second question is go goes to the Mr. Geta Chorada. Uh, you have said uh, all about the political turmoil and political. Uh, Catastrophic of Ethiopia, and according to your uh, uh, presentation, I understand uh, there the, there is a deep mistrust between uh, the PLF and uh, Abi or the, the Prosperity Party. On the other side, there is also the people of Tigray who who uh, uh, totally or completely stand for self-determination, as, as Oha said. And you uh, recommend as a national dialogue will uh, a remedy or a solution for the current Ethiopian deep political crisis. Do you think that the, the Ethiopian political uh, forces or political parties are the nationalist and the federalist as well as unitarist? So this uh, 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 political parties has a rather sharp to reconcile or to make a national dialogue in one table. So in my view, uh, that national dialogue is more feasible or how this national dialogue can reconcile the incompatible interest of these three political parties, not only political parties and the people that are surrounding or supporting for this uh, parties, for the nationalist, unitarist and federalist that, that Ethiopia has a capacity even any political party that come to Addis uh, Ababa or Arad Kilo can solve this problem. Uh, so this is my question. And the last is for Matt Bryden. Uh, he raised that there is a political and the constitutional transition in the Horn of Africa. So what will result this political and the constitutional transition in the Horn of Africa? Is there is an opportunity or a chance to create a new nation status in the Horn of Africa, or maybe uh, maybe this transition will exist in a vicious circle that is region change and region come or government come, government goes. Thank you very much. Uh, perhaps perhaps I could go first. I, I think Uh, perhaps I could go first. I think the, the first question uh, that Gabra Hiwat uh, asked was directed towards me. If I, if I understood the question properly, uh, I'm asking... Uh, I'm getting a lot of feedback on the, uh, the call here. Are you hearing me okay now? Uh, if I understood Governor Hewat's question properly, uh, you're asking why the United States is not engaged in uh, resolving differences between Ethiopia and Eritrea. Is is that the the uh, thrust of your question, Governor Hewat? Okay, I gather I gather that is it. Let me, by way of background. Uh, 
because I was very much involved in this back in 1998, a long time ago, uh, when I was serving as ambassador to Ethiopia, and the whole conflict broke out between Ethiopia and Eritrea. You did have a, a major effort by then Assistant Secretary of State Susan Rice, who has moved on to many other positions since then. And if, if uh, Biden is elected president, will almost certainly be in a, a senior position in the U.S. government again. But Susan Rice led a major effort in 1998 to try to resolve the differences between uh, Ethiopia and Eritrea using shuttle diplomacy between Asmara and Addis Ababa. Uh, that effort made some progress, but it ultimately did not succeed. Uh, it was taken over by uh, Tony Lake, a very close um, advisor to President Clinton. Uh, Tony Lake tried for quite a number of months to do shuttle diplomacy and also did not succeed in the effort, although I think both Susan Rice and Tony Lake uh, contributed in a positive way to the ultimate outcome that the uh, African Union resolved and you had ultimately the, the Algiers Agreement two years later. So the United States does have a history of getting involved uh, in the, the Eritrea-Ethiopia issue. Uh, I don't think you're going, in fact, I know you're not going to see that happen in the current environment in the United States where everything revolves around the American election. And it's, it's just not realistic to um, expect the United States government to undertake any such effort uh, with the uh, Trump administration uh, when everyone is focused on trying to become elected president. Uh, now, that could change come January of next year. With the new administration, there might be something of a willingness to become more engaged. Uh, but even then, the question will become, what leverage does the United States have, particularly with Eritrea? Uh, the U.S.-Eritrean relationship is not good at the moment. We don't even have an ambassador in Eritrea and have not had one there for a long time. Um, it would be important to have a, a mediator or someone who can be helpful who has stronger relationships in both Ethiopia and Eritrea than is the case today for the United States. So I'm not sure that even with a change of administration uh, come January, that there's going to be much likelihood for U.S. involvement on this particular issue. But thank you for the question. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? You can continue. Get at you, are you online? Hello. Love Matthew. Love Matthew then also. Okay, okay. Next ambassador, sir. You you would move and join us. Uh, at the outset, I wanted to to, uh, to thank the organizers of this uh, very important uh, discussion. By the same token, I would like to extend my thanks 
uh, to the panelists. And I must say, I'm uh, glad to see Ambassador Shin in a long time. The last time I saw him was when I was posted in Washington. I was saying that uh, I'm glad to see Ambassador Shin and also uh, Dad. Dade, I think he, I thought he was in the States. We'll come back. And really, uh, for a very interesting discussion, of course, our own uh, uh, Mr. Getacho, as always, he has enlightened us on the ongoing political uh, thinking of the region. As a point of uh, remark, observation, I have. Uh, never been as pessimistic as I am as a long time observer of the political and diplomatic uh, situation in the Horn of Africa. And I'm afraid my pessimism was strengthened by Mr. Uh, Bryden, given what he just said regarding our neighbors. Uh, having said this, I have three questions uh, to our panelists. The first one is to for Ambassador Shin to comment, reflect again. As you said, the U.S. and the, the Ethiopia has a long uh, diplomatic and uh, relationship. Uh, I knew this from my career both in Washington and the United Nations. That's why we we value and at the same time we concern about the steps that the current administration uh, takes towards Ethiopia. Uh, my question to you is, uh, incidentally, I watched the Democratic National Convention, which was almost uh, in the uh, 5, 4 a.m. Uh, Ethiopia time, for the mere fact that what kind of foreign relations will be reflected by Vice President Biden, the now DNC uh, nominee? And uh, it looks, other than to say, the United Nations will not be body body with dictators. There wasn't any substantial foreign uh, policy element in his speech. Uh, well, if you consider uh, by U.S. standard that the Democratic nominee is talking about South Korea and maybe Putin, it leaves some of us still not comfortable with the current administration. And therefore, the, the peace uh, deal with the Eritrea, which we think was mainly orchestrated and supported by the U.S., and as a neighboring adjacent state here in Tigray, we, we thought we'll be benefiting more than the rest of Ethiopia. It is now at limbo. Given what we just said earlier, the Eritrean government does not have a good relationship with the U.S. How, how do this piece the ambassador motto broke the peace deal between our two countries if in fact there wasn't any element of reconciliation between Eritrea and Ethiopia. The second post part of my, post my question to you is yes we will not expect anything uh, from the current administration during this election time if anything berserk was going to take place here in Ethiopia or Eritrea, the federal government of Ethiopia was going to take some dramatic negative action against uh, any region in Ethiopia. The U.S. the U.S. eyes will be not on Ethiopia but somewhere else. And given the history of Eritrea, what happened during the 9/11, that is a point of concern. So, 
uh, what is your observation on this? My second uh, question is to Mr. Bryden. I appreciate very much for the scenario that you put for Somalia. I will give you some premises if you can give us another scenario for Ethiopia. The case of election, national uh, election versus regional, I will not deal on the constitutional or legal otherwise. But let me, let me give you this. The real government and the ruling party have two options. One, to accept what it considered illegal and constitutional and suspend the election and continue to rule the region. Or if it says, I don't have a mandate to rule, to resign and say, I will not be uh, governing the state and therefore abrogate its responsibility. This is a scenario some Ethiopian intellectuals are discussing as opposed to go ahead and, con and run an election. And therefore coming September, when the central government's mandate will end, we will have a new regional government. Given what you just said about the state of uh, Somalia, what scenario can you perceive regarding our country, Ethiopia? The last question is for my friend Rade. You have spoken about more democratization of the federal parliaments. I concur and I agree with you. In the meantime, what would you say what's happening in Ethiopia in terms of marginalization? The TPLF and the Pacific. The ruling regional government, the TPLF, is null and void in the, in, the, in the central government. It has been cleansed for all practical purposes. But it is a legitimate representative of the regional government, exclusive of the TPLF. It does not include the TPLF. Beyond that, careers and professionals are now being purged in the administration branch. Worse than that, the Tigrayan community at large, especially outside Tigray fields, there is a deja vu. What the Derg regime did to Tigrayans as suspects, citizens, now the feeling is unless one has to take an allegiance to the new party, your citizenship, your patriotism is in question. So until we have this reform of the uh, legislative part of the government, how do we deal with this current and why is the international community, especially the diplomatic corsetting and others, not looking into this? Should, uh, should I go first on this one? Uh, I, I hear no objections, so I will. Uh, good, uh, good to see you, Gabriel Selassie. Uh, there were a couple parts to your question, and the, the first part dealt with the Democratic uh, Convention, which concluded last night. Uh, you quite rightly pointed out there was almost no discussion of foreign affairs uh, throughout the entire convention, there were some references to it, but uh, very few, and no direct references to Africa that I recall at all. I watched the entire convention. That's not too unusual in a um, in a either Republican or Democratic convention, since the focus is on on domestic issues. Uh, so I wouldn't be too concerned about the lack of reference to foreign affairs. I would point out that um, the I know the Biden campaign is very involved in foreign affairs, and it's not surprising that it is. Uh, Senator Biden used to be on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, was very involved personally in foreign affairs. 
And of course, his vice president was very much engaged in foreign affairs. So I think you can be assured that um, if the Biden uh, team is elected, that they will be very much engaged not only in foreign affairs, but in African affairs. Uh, I did participate uh, a couple of weeks ago in a what we call a fundraiser uh, for the, the Biden campaign. And the fundraiser was led by Senator Kunz of uh, Delaware, who is also on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, Susan Rice, who is, was being considered as a vice presidential candidate, and several other people who are part of the foreign um, relations uh, advisory team for, uh, for uh, Vice President Biden. And the whole focus of the session was Africa. In fact, uh, that was the reason for bringing a, a lot of us together uh, to discuss African issues uh, in this fundraising effort. So I'm, I'm convinced that there will be a significant focus on Africa if there is a Biden administration. Now, the second part of your question dealt with Eritrea-Ethiopia relations and a reference to Ambassador Yamamoto and I didn't hear all of it, uh, could I ask you to just summarize quickly the, uh, the point or the question that you were asking about Ethiopia, Eritrea? Hello, Ambassador Shin? Yes. Can you hear me? Sorry, they've just asked me to tell you from Malala University that they've lost the connection. So no, oh. nobody, nobody heard your response. Oh my goodness. Uh, hmm. um, they're just working on getting the connection back. If, if you'll give them a few minutes. Okay, so the problem is on your end and not my end? Yes, it's, it's on, it's on, it's, a, it's in Megali, the problem. I Problems see. In okay. 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 Give us a few minutes. Okay. Thank you. Hello, can you? Is, is the connection back? Uh, it's back now, yes. You can continue. Okay. I, I gather I was talking to myself for five minutes. Uh, okay. I, 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 myself I, I, was re, I was trying to respond to the last question or a couple of questions. And dealt with the, uh, the just concluded Democratic Convention that took place in the United States and Gabriel Selassie's observation that there was almost no discussion of foreign policy and no discussion of African issues. And he's quite correct in that. Uh, I listened to the entire convention this past week and uh, it, there, there were very few references to foreign policy. That's not too unusual for American political conventions when you're nominating candidate, presidential candidates. 
uh, the American public is far more focused on domestic issues like the pandemic and the economy and various other things than they are foreign policy issues. Uh, so I wasn't too surprised at the uh, lack of reference to foreign policy. Having said that, uh, I would make a strong case that um, uh, Joe Biden will have a very strong interest in foreign affairs. He was for many years on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, was very active on that committee. Uh, as vice president for eight years, he took a very active engagement in foreign policy issues. Uh, so I have no doubt that the administration, if he is elected, uh, will focus uh, heavily on foreign policy. Uh, in terms of Africa specifically, I was part of a fundraising effort a couple of weeks ago uh, with the, uh, the Biden campaign. And the entire um, purpose of the meeting was to discuss Africa. Uh, it was led uh, by Senator Coons of Delaware, who's a very close confidant of Senator Biden. Uh, Senator Coons is also on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, he is the uh, senator, the, the minority member on the Africa Subcommittee, has a deep interest in African affairs. Uh, Susan Rice was part of the discussion. Uh, I think Susan Rice will become an important part of the Biden administration should he be elected. And she, of course, has a long background in African affairs. So I, I don't have any concerns about um, a, a Biden administration uh, should it be uh, elected having a strong engagement in Africa. The second part of the question dealt with ethiopia Eritrean relations and there was a reference to Ambassador Yamamoto, and I must confess I did not hear all of it. If I could ask uh, Gabra Selassie to just quickly repeat the question about Ethiopia, Eritrea, and the United States so that I understand what was being asked. Ambassador, I think the Russellas is not online. So can you proceed to the next question? Well, that that was all. That was all for me. Uh, I'll, I'll have to. Maybe I can move it on. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Ambassador. We move on to the next uh, uh, speaker. I think it's David Matthew. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think I've got two questions. Um, the first being about the, the political and constitutional um, transition and whether introducing a sort of new dispensation across the Horn of Africa. Um, and I, it's it's a fascinating idea. It's very it's a very exciting idea. Um, unfortunately, uh, I don't think that's the most likely outcome uh, for uh, for a couple of reasons. The main one, though, is that um, the kinds of major changes and shifts that would be required for long term structural reforms, and I don't mean structurally economic reform, also political, also let's talk about movement of people and goods and, uh, and so on, uh, economic integration. All of this would require um, sovereign governments with uh, fairly robust mandates um, to, to take those kinds of decisions. And so I think, unfortunately, one of the consequences of having governments that are facing transitions um, is and the, the decisions they take may not be respected by incoming um, administrations, especially if there are constitutional changes, um, is that they are they um, are going to be or should be necessarily cautious about the kinds of commitments um, that they're going to make. I think this, we see a lot of this, particularly in the, the behavior of the government, transitional government of Sudan at the moment. Um, from my own experience, where we see 
transitional governments tried to behave as though they actually had uh, full mandates, as though they had been elected or chosen through due process. Um, as in Somalia, we don't really have a, you know, we have a, a government elected by 14,000 people uh, for what that's worth. Um, and um, of course, in, in Ethiopia, the, the, the ruling party uh, didn't exist uh, until very recently. So um, in, in situations where governments try to behave as though they have a mandate, um, then their decisions, their actions are you know, unlikely to, be, to, to lead to the kind of follow through that we need. So I think what we, the, the scenario we can hope for is, is to see what this transition produces. And then when we see governments that are now finally stabilized, their constitutions have been uh, reviewed, revisited, um, le legitimated in whatever form, and the governments themselves have some sense of security in their mandates, that's when really uh, significant negotiations can take place. Uh, but I wouldn't expect that during this current um, period of, of, frankly, of turbulence. Uh, the second question um, on the, the implications of, I, if I understood correctly, uh, what's happening in Ethiopia and the you know, potential crises around elections in Ethiopia and the impact on Somalia. Um, for now, uh, the impact is, I would argue, that Ethiopia is less active in Somalia than it was, say, a year ago. Um, a year ago, Ethiopia was was um, very much um, in the forefront of um, executing decisions on behalf of the federal government, of um, taking military action against um, opponents of the federal government, really seemed to be the muscle that the government itself lacked um, in the absence of, of a really effective national army. And so it seemed that e Ethiopia, in a sense, was prepared to act as um, Somalia's national, or part of Somalia's national military force. Uh, now I think e as Ethiopia is, not, is, is inward looking, is focused on domestic politics and the challenges that are, are coming up, uh, there's less appetite and probably um, some constraints on resources. And as I understand it, there has also been some rethinking uh, in uh, the cabinet as to uh, what direction uh, Ethiopia's policy vis-a-vis -vis Somalia should be. Uh, I think um, we hear this from Turkey as well uh, in its discussions with um, or in the way it engages with the Somali government and the way it engages with, it talks about the Qatari UAE dispute. Uh, and I believe this applies to Ethiopia as well. Um, Somalia, Somali, the Somali population tends to uh, respect and appreciate support that is for the people and the institutions of Somalia, not assistance that seems to be uh, towards the benefit of an individual or a political or a clan clique at the expense of others. So governments that have supported the current federal government of Somalia um, in opposition to the federal member states and opposition parties are very unlikely to have good relations with the next government of Somalia. Um, so I think for Ethiopia, which uh, benefits from the potential access to the sea, uh, which is the, uh, the main market for transit goods through Somalia, which has a massive movement of population uh, in both directions, Ethiopians and Somalis, uh, for employment, for um, migration, for what have you, uh, the, the best scenario would be for Ethiopia to disengage from Somali politics uh, and leave, if it leaves forces on the ground, um, to make sure those forces operate strictly within their mandate to fight al-Shabaab uh, to maintain law and order and, and protect um, civic institutions. But um, executing the instructions of uh, the presidency at the expense of other political actors, I think that was just going to lead uh, ultimately to very bad relations between uh, future Somali leadership and, and Ethiopia. Thank you.
Uh, thank you, Matthew. Uh, uh, before I give the chance to get at you, I, I think uh, it's better to finish all the questions uh, from the participants. So I'll give the chance to first some analysts and then next to Abraha Gebra Aragawi, and then we'll, I'll come back again to the uh, presenters. Somehow you can continue if you can hear me. Hi, thanks. I just withdrew my question. But thank you for the opportunity. Can you hear me somehow? Yeah, I can hear you. I can, can yeah, you hear you can, me? You can go on then. Yeah, no, yeah, I, I would um I'd like to I'd like to withdraw my question, but thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> 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 Okay, thank you very much uh, for the chat. Uh, I would like first to uh, extend my appreciation for the organizers for selecting this interesting topic, challenges, uh, the challenges um, and prospects of peace in the Horn of Africa. Then, uh, as you know, the Horn is geopolitically well, a strategic location where nearly 50 to 60 percent of uh, the world's economic transaction are uh, takes place through especially oil uh, in fact uh, the problems within the horn are are multitude and highly complicated to one another but we can uh, simply categorize into two broad categories as internal and external challenges and due to uh, time limitations uh, i will not uh, focus on the challenges and the peace rather uh, i will immediately proceed to my uh, two brief questions to Sir ambassador david shin my first question will be uh, on the issue of on the issue of um, the Ethiopian political change underwent in the past two three years. I remember uh, President Donald Trump once upon a time were claiming for the Peace Nobel Prize, saying uh, I made a deal with Ethiopian forces, and this showed that America and of course other external powers are highly, highly intervening in the internal affairs of Ethiopia and the Horn of Africa. And then my question is, don't you think that America is making a fatal mistake in nominating and selecting uh, an experienced young with no proof of legitimacy and poor uh, social base for Ethiopia and uh, destabilizing the country and the region as a whole. What do you feel on that? And my second question is regarding uh, the Nile uh, River and the Ethiopian Grand Renaissance Dam project. Again, uh, as we all know, America was first interested as uh, a neutral mediator on the negotiation within the tripartite agreement, Egypt, Ethiopia, and Sudan. The latter, America has changed itself from neutral mediator to arbitrator and began to force Ethiopia to sign on, on, on the agreement, which may, be, which may be a historic fatal mistake for Ethiopia, which was the tennis which are uh, uh, Ethiopia's future development on the river. So again, uh, could you please uh, say something about this? Thank you very much. Uh, 
Uh, I, I think it's better to start uh, with Gabriel. He was question towards uh, Getacha Ruda. Getacha Ruda, tell him another moment. Okay, Ambassador, can you hear me? You can continue then. Okay. Uh, there were two questions there. The second question, I understood what was being uh, asked. The first question, I did not hear all of it. Uh, the first question dealt with, with President Trump and the U.S. making a mistake. Uh, and I thought I heard something about Nobel Prize, but if, if the... Uh, the person asking the question would just repeat the first question to me. Uh, I, I think he was asking uh, if, if the U.S. is making uh, uh, mistakes by giving support to the uh, Abiy uh, administration. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, let me let me try to take that question first. The the United States is, is obviously going to um, be supportive of whatever government is in power, and that happens to be the Abiy administration uh, at the moment. And it, the alternatives, I'm not sure what the alternative would be. Um, if if uh, there are problems with the, what the Abiy administration is doing, the United States needs to make those concerns known uh, to the administration, and it may very well be. I'm not part of the administration anymore, so I don't know what is being said. Uh, but it's unrealistic to, uh, to not support a government in power, or at least accept their, their governance. Uh, and I, I, I don't see any particular criticism of, um, of U.S. policy vis-a-vis the Abiy government at the present time. Uh, most of the support that the, that the United States provides for Ethiopia tends to be in the developmental and humanitarian category in any event. Uh, so it's aimed at, uh, at supporting the people of Ethiopia. Uh, the second question dealt with the Nile water question and the U.S. role in that. I referred to that earlier in my opening remarks and I think I implied pretty strongly that uh, I felt that intervention was uh, a mistake. Um, it was um, an intervention that was instigated more by Egypt than it was by Ethiopia. Uh, eventually it failed and the United States um, essentially pulled out of the process, which has now been turned over to the African Union. Uh, I believe the, the question suggested that the United States was trying to force Ethiopia to do something. I think that's too strong of a term. I don't think that, it, that the United States was ever trying to force Ethiopia, but I, I would agree with uh, that part of the question that suggested the United States was, was taking a position that seemed to be favoring Egypt over Ethiopia. But that's different than forcing Ethiopia to do something. Um, and the main point now is the United States has removed itself from the discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, for your... Uh Thank you, Ambassador, for your uh, fascinating answers to the question raised by the participants. Uh, I think I'm going to give the chance to get at your die online. Hello. Okay. 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 
Hello, Dada. Are you there? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, I, I, I think you are requested to make some reflections uh, on the on, on the paper that you presented from uh, if I mistake. If I, I'm not mistaken, from uh, Ambassador so did did you get that question, or would you like a repeat yes. of that question? No, I I heard him well, so I'm going to repeat. Can I continue then? Uh, I guess I can continue, right? <laughs> All right. Yes, uh, there was one uh, one question from uh, Ambassador Fasa. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, and good to see you. I am still joining you from the US. Uh, you can continue, Dad. I can hear you. Can you hear me? I started off. You can't. You can't hear me. I'm not on mute, am I? Yes, continue. Yes, continue. All right. Yes, continue. So, uh, what a question about uh, about the uh, pushing the uh, TPLF representatives from the uh, uh, entire federal government system. I can hear. And hear you. You can't hear me? Anybody can hear me? Can someone signal to me if um, I'm being heard? Yeah. The, the moderator is not hearing me. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm being heard, right? Yeah. All right, now. Let me continue then. Uh, I can see Solomon, for example. Can you show me your hand if I'm being heard? Yes? Okay. I can see it. All right, then let me continue. So uh, it's really very unfortunate uh, the uh, federal government and the PMR uh, pushing uh, all uh, TPLF uh, cabinet members and maybe uh, other higher officials from, from the uh, uh, federal uh, positions. Um, uh, this is really a very, very ill-advised, I would say. Uh, it also means uh, like cutting uh, further or distancing Tigray from the uh, from the federal uh, system, from the whole union, uh, which further implies a lot of uh, political fragmentation than, uh, than really pushing individuals. Uh, so. It's also very pity that there, there weren't many reporters and uh, news makings about it uh, by the media. I think this should have been exposed or criticized by media and analysts, uh, I would say, as the uh, implication of this is uh, really grave. Uh, uh, it's not about individuals, it's just about uh, distancing the whole um, federation uh, uh, entity. Uh, from uh, its uh, from its uh, participation, uh, so as much as it's uh, an assault on uh, on on Tigray, it's also an assault on the on the whole uh, uh, federal system. And what can be done about it? Uh, yeah, it's wrong. There is no question about it. Uh, it's not it's not even debatable. Uh, well, the why is he doing it? I I, I really don't know. Uh, uh, it could be to, to irritate the TPLF. It could be like to you know remove challenges as uh, most of the TPLF uh, uh, officials are senior members and confidently challenging uh, policy makings, policy decisions. Um, it, it could be on uh, because of uh, 
influence from his advisors uh, that have uh, misgivings on, on, on TPLF. Uh, uh, it doesn't matter really, but uh, it's a very, very uh, unfortunate uh, decision. Uh, so the ideal way would be uh, challenging it uh, through the formal institutions, uh, the courts, for example. Uh, but I don't think that would be the uh, uh, that will bring an outcome that's uh, satisfactory or different from what is now. So the remaining thing would be like um, exposing it to the light, so that people would know, uh, the, the media analysts would know, uh, and then. Uh, name it, shame it, uh, uh, the way it, it needs to be said, uh, other than that. But it, it is really uh, one unfortunate uh, thing that's happening uh, to uh, really uh, bring the uh, whole federal system, the uh, democratization, uh, even under more assault. Uh, and and uh, and it's said being done in, in a way that's not getting the uh, enough public light is also something else that, that need to be, needs to be said. Uh, so this is the only thing I can say about this, uh, and thank you for the question. No, uh, I'm done. Uh, did you hear any of the things I have said? Uh, I'm sorry, there was, a, there was a breakdown, I guess. Uh, I thought that was... So, so, so uh, I'm done uh, for my end. Okay, th thank you, Dada. Uh, is there any uh, any of you from the presenters who would like to make any reflections on the points raised by the participants? 